What? Good evening. Oh, see, I didn't press the button. Let me come up here, press this button. It's rehearsal. That's all that was. Okay. Again. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Roxanne Jones Booth, and I'm the co pastor of Riverview Baptist Church in Queens. I think you all know that. And I serve alongside my husband, Reverend Antonio Booth. And I'm also an adjunct professor at the State University of New York at Albany. There, I teach a course in the Department of African Studies entitled African African American Religions. And um, during the semester, um, towards maybe the middle of the semester, we look at Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail as we discuss a nonviolent protest and that nonviolent protest being more than a political tactic. I should say, um, my students have a question about this uh, letter from a Birmingham jail on their final examination. So, I, last semester, the question was, <laughs> see if you can answer this at, by the end of the <laughs> <laughs> so, I think you will. Um, in Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail, he lists several reasons why his nonviolent protest activities are not unwise or untimely. Discuss three of three responses Dr. King gives for why the nonviolent protest activities are not unwise or untimely, and how do his responses reflect his faith. It's always important to remember that Dr. King was an ordained Baptist minister. So in all that he did, and we'll see even in his letter from Birmingham jail, he espouses his faith. It comes through, it's evident. In every speech you might hear that um, he has um, delivered those speeches, you will hear his faith coming through. So even in this letter, um, I call it a case for nonviolent protest because his letter is in response to a letter written by clergy in Alabama. But before we get there, a um, couple things I wanted to also say about his letter. I, I was curious myself as to how this letter was composed because he was in jail. Did they give him a pencil? And, Anybody think about that? <laughs> Pencil, some paper, a pad of paper. No, they didn't. But he did have a newspaper. And so um, he did write a lot of the letter on the edges of the newspaper. And those notes were smuggled out of the jail by Wyatt T. Walker, the executive director of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And then Dr. King's secretary, Willie Pearl Mackey, she put those notes together. And there is a typed copy of the letter that was then sent to, as like a, a press release from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference of which Dr. King was the president. So that um, typed copy of this letter was comprised from these little bits of information that Dr. King, or little bits of the letter that Dr. King wrote on the edges of a newspaper, and then they were smuggled out. Um, you can find his letter from a Birmingham jail in many sources. Just Google it. You'll find it. It's often uh, condensed uh, information taken out in some places because it's very long. Um, after she, his secretary compiled, it was 20 pages long. That's a letter. That's like a book almost. It's an essay. It's a term paper, <laughs> but it was 20 pages typed, and I mean typed, not on a computer, typewriter. <laughs> so she spent a lot of time putting it together. But I, um, in my class, we utilized this uh, particular little essay speech book called I Have a Dream and um, Letter from a Birmingham Jail. And even in this document, um, portions of the letter um, are not here but they, they mesh together as much as, as we would need to understand what, how he was responding. Okay, so 
Nonviolent protest is a byproduct of civil disobedience. The refusal to comply with certain laws or to pay taxes or fines as a peaceful form of political protest. Um, Nonviolent protest is born out of uh, civil disobedience. And we, we know about civil disobedience from, well, we think of Mahatma Gandhi, but before him, back in 1849, Henry Thoreau wrote this wonderful treatise on civil disobedience, uh, particularly called Resistance to Civil Government. And particularly, he was talking about resistance to slavery um, and resistance of slavery and resistance uh, um, with regard to the Mexican-American War. So he wrote this treatise and then it became um, utilized throughout uh, history and then uh, Gandhi was able to use this idea of civil disobedience not only in India, but before India, Gandhi was in South Africa and he was instrumental in starting the resistance movement in South Africa. Um, and then from South Africa, and that was like 19, 1914, then he left South Africa, returned to India, and started the resistance movement in India. And then we have know, of course, India gained independence from Britain. And Dr. King has said it several times in different places, particularly in his book, Stride Toward Freedom, which is a book that documented the Montgomery bus boycott, that civil disobedience, or really nonviolent protest, which is what I say was born, is born out of civil disobedience, is the only way Christians could actively engage in the struggle without violating the humanity of another human being. So here he is saying, we have to engage in actively, do, uh, uh, actively participate in this struggle um, against injustice, and we can only do it through nonviolent uh, protest because it's the only way uh, we're not going to violate the humanity of another human being. So, with that said, I know this is very small. It's difficult to see this when you're sitting at the computer and really see the size of it all. But what I try to do is let's get the setting for Alabama 1963. Because Dr. King wrote this in um, April, of, uh, April 16, 1963. So what I have here is something that kind of will get us focused in or we can wrap our minds around the setting. We're talking about 1963. Anybody born before 1963? <laughs> I was only... Half the world. <laughs> really? Yeah, I was, at this time, in April, by April 1963, I was two years old. <laughs> yeah. So when I read this, I yes, wow, seems so, you know, at the time when I was reading it in college, in undergraduate school, um, it seemed like, wow, that was a crazy time. But then, as I read it now, I'm like, wow, this is relevant. So, 1963, Alabama, Jim Crow segregation. We know that that was the law of the land, 1963. What did that mean? It meant there were enforced separation of groups because of ethnicity, enforced. There were laws that were in place. We go back to um, Plessy versus Ferguson, which was back in 1800s, 1850s or so. In that look case, um, the Supreme Court ruled that we could have separate accommodations, but they must be equal. So it became law. You know, you heard of separate but equal. Yes, and so Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, the Supreme Court ruled that there, there could be separate accommodations, public accommodations, but they have to be equal. So it became law. Separate public accommodations, separate accommodations in restaurants, 
in um, theaters, toilets, water fountains, libraries, schools, I don't taxis. Taxis. taxis and buses. <laughs> Separate. A taxi. Couldn't ride in the same taxis. And everything had to be, quote unquote, air quotes, equal. Um, so that was the case. That's 1963. And so in Alabama, there was a campaign for equal accommodation in, in Alabama. Um, the African American population, along with um, other whites in the community in Alabama and Birmingham, in Alabama in the whole and in Birmingham, they were saying, look, we need the desegregation of lunch counters and all public facilities in all downtown stores. They were just fighting for desegregation. They wanted desegregation. Um, when you think about Plessy Ferguson's Ferguson in 1896, before 1963, there was another Supreme Court ruling that knocked down segregation. And that was in 1954. Anybody know? Brown versus the Board of Education. Okay, so by 1963, you're not supposed to have any more segregated places, but in Alabama, because as my husband always says, what was that quote in that uh, 1954, how long should it take? With all deliberate speed. With all deliberate speed. Right. <laughs> yes. Right. So by 1963, they're asking for desegregation of lunch counters, immediate establishment of fair hiring practices in stores, including employment, of qualified Negroes, and this is the terminology at the time uh, for white collar jobs, dropping of all charges against those who have been arrested during sit ins, and sit ins were part of the, the nonviolent direct action. Sit ins, sitting at counters that were um, in restaurants that were relegated only to whites, um, march ins, pray ins, all of those that were taking place. Um, the establishment of fair hiring practices in all city departments, reopen, reopening of city parks and playgrounds, all of which are now closed to avoid desegregation, and the establishment of a biracial group to work out the timetable for it. Discriminate uh, des desegregation of all Birmingham public schools. So, but Birmingham public schools that should have been already in, in place, but they were they were not. So, groups of people got together to um, to campaign for equal accommodation, not only African Americans but also whites. So then, some significant events in 1963 leading up to when Dr. King was um, placed in jail in Birmingham. These are some things I just pulled out because this sets the stage for what he then writes. So January 14th, beginning of the year, George Wallace becomes the governor of Alabama and in his inaugural address, in the very first address to the people, he says, Segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. So here's now the governor in 1963, beginning of the year, setting the tone for the, the state. Okay, so then March 24, um, a heavy explosion heard over much of Alabama, uh, Birmingham destroys a black residence, injuring at least two people and damaging houses and other buildings over two block radius. And this was occurring bombings, and they used to call it Bombingham, because bombings were taking place on a regular basis. This was in March. By September was the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, where the four little girls were killed. So the nickname for Birmingham became Bombingham, because these bombings were taking place on a regular basis in black communities, um, trying to stop the demonstrations and put an end to the, the, the fight for desegregation. April 5th, the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights and the Southern Christian Leadership Council um, led a sit-in demonstration at downtown Birmingham lunch counters 
20 participants are arrested at bricks and other lunch counters. And this would go on and on. As people were arrested, others would come in and sit down. And I'm sure you've seen many of the, um, the footage around that. Um, people, I must say right here, the individuals who went to sit-ins, they went to a freedom school to learn how to sit in. Because everybody can't take it. <laughs> and Dr. King would encourage people who knew that they wouldn't be able to sit and take the abuse that took place. He would encourage them, do something in the office. Come and help us hand out leaflets or flyers, but don't do this. And at the Freedom Schools, um, people were learning how to be um, nonviolent in their protests. Um, we were just recently at the Civil Rights Museum at Christmas in um, Atlanta, Georgia, and they have a simulation of sitting at a lunch counter. So in the museum, only four people can sit at a time, and it's a lunch counter. It's 1960 something, and you put your hands on the counter, on the on the, on the counter of the, the the lunch counter. Close your eyes. You have headphones on. They can put headphones on. You're sitting on the stools with your hands planted in the ha places where they have um, uh, prints of hands, and you sit there. Close your eyes, and you start to hear people in your ears. Get up, get up, and then they make the chair move like somebody just pushed you. And it's, it is an experience you have to have. The simulation, and you don't move, you know, because you're not supposed to. If you were there, you have to stay like this, and it is really disturbing. Um, I just the sensation was, I did cry because I could have couldn't imagine. This in reality, you know, I'm being, this is a simulation. But to hear what was going on, what the people were saying, whew, my goodness. So those people had to go to a school and learn how to sit there. That was something. So then by April the 5th, I mean April the 7th, is Palm Sunday, uh, Reverend A.D. King, which is Dr. King's brother, and Reverend Nelson Smith and um, John Porter, they led a march beginning at St. Paul Methodist Church, 6th Avenue, there in Birmingham. Police dogs are used to dispense the black onlookers. So they led this, um, the march, and the police came to disperse everything. Then, that's Palm Sunday. April 11th, Dr. King and other leaders, they received a court order injunction against Boycotting, trespassing, parading, picketing, sit-ins, kneelings, uh, weigh-ins. They just, you can't do it. They got a summons. The next day, <laughs> they get the summons, but the next day is Good Friday. And Dr. King, Ralph Ab Abernathy, Reverend uh, Shuttlesworth, they lead a march in defiance of the injunction, and they're arrested within yards of... Um, the same place they, they marched the previous week, well, on Palm Sunday. Um, and then Dr. King is incarcerated. So he's incarcerated that year on Good Friday. This is the original photo of his arrest in Birmingham on um, that day. And this was in Time Magazine with a, um, Time Magazine didn't approve of the demonstration. Um, you can go online and read the article, what they wrote. They were, uh, they were not in agreement with what was done. But this is the, the, at the time that he was arrested in uh, Birmingham. <clears throat> While in jail, that very same day, um, a statement is written by eight Alabama clergymen. And it's... Um, placed in several local newspapers in Birmingham uh, with regard to denouncing Dr. King and the efforts of the people in their campaign for desegregation. The public statement by the eight Alabama clergymen was published in Alabama local newspapers, urging blacks to withdraw their support from Dr. King and his demonstrations. Although they were in basic agreement with King, 
that segregation should be eliminated. They accused King, first of all, of being an outsider, of using extreme measures that incited hatred and violence, and that King's demonstrations are unwise and untimely. So you can see where I got my question for the students from, right? So this is what they said. And I, I want to read this because we have to, I'm not going to read Dr. King, I told you it was 20 pages long in his response to what they wrote, which is not even a quarter of the size of what he, he, he wrote. So here on the day he's arrested, they say, we understand, understand clergymen are among those who in January issued an appeal for law and order and common sense in dealing with racial problems in Alabama. We express understanding that honest convictions and racial matters could properly be pursued in the courts, but urge that decisions of those courts should be, in the meantime, be peacefully obeyed. Since that time, there have been some evidence of increased forbearance and a willingness to face facts. Um, responsible citizens have undertaken to work on various problems which cause racial friction and unrest. In Birmingham, recent public events have given an indication that we all have opportunity for a new constructive and realistic approach to racial problems. However, we are now confronted by a series of demonstrations by some of our Negro citizens directed and led in part by outsiders. We recognize the natural impatience of people who feel that their hopes are now slow in being realized, but we are convinced that these demonstrations are unwise and untimely. We agree, rather, with certain local Negro leadership, which has called for honest and open negotiation of racial issues in our area. And we believe this kind of facing of issues can best be accomplished by citizens of our own metropolitan area, white and Negro, meeting with their knowledge and experience of the local situation. All of us need to face that responsibility and find proper channels for its accomplishment. Just as we formerly pointed out that hatred and violence have no sanction in our religious and political tradition, we also point out that such actions as incite to hatred and violence however technically peaceful those actions may be, have not contributed to the resolution of our local problems. We do not believe that these days of new hope and, and are days when extreme measures are justified in Birmingham. We commend the community as a whole and the local media and the law enforcement officials in particular on the calm manner in which these demonstrations have been handled. We urge the public to continue to show restraint should the demonstrations continue and the law enforcement officials to remain calm and continue to protect our city from violence. We further strongly urge our own Negro community to withdraw support from these demonstrations and to unite locally in working peacefully for a better Birmingham. When rights are consistently denied, a cause should be pressed in the courts and in negotiation among local leaders and not in the streets. We appeal to both white and Negro citizenry, citizenry um, to observe the principles of law and order and common sense. And these are the individuals who signed this um, document. So they wrote this statement. It was placed in local papers. And then Dr. King read it. And then on April 16th, he wanted to respond. Or he did respond. Now, I just lifted up five, five um, concerns raised by the Alabama clergy that we're going to look at. Because there are lots in there. But let's just look at these five. They, they were concerned about their being confronted by a series of demonstrations by some of the Negro citizens directed and led by a part, uh, in part, by outsiders. So that was, they, they, they espoused that it was, the demonstrations were unwise and untimely actions of the black community. They agreed with certain local Negro leaders, which had called for honest and open negotiations of racial issues in the area. 
actions as incited to hatred and violence, however technically peaceful those actions may be, have not contributed, they thought, to the resolution of our local problems. And then finally, we do not believe that these days of new hope are days when extreme measures are justified in Birmingham. So we're going to look out how Dr. King responded in those five areas. And then I encourage you, in your own leisure, read the entire letter. <laughs> like I said, it's 20 pages typed. So he opens with, my dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling our present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom if ever do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas, but since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and are 